Hey everyone, my name is AJ and welcome to Philosophy Battle. Before this video starts, I just want to make clear that this video is about logic and whether or to what extent there can be alternative logics. Because if there can be alternative logics, then which logic we are using can be considered relative to some other factors. And typically logic is taken to be one of the strongholds against claims to relativism. Logic is often taken to be as proof of something that isn't relative, much like math. So this video will introduce also some basic logic and the basic concepts of logic and if you are already familiar with logic, well just be a little bit patient, the more philosophically gripping stuff will come at the end. Either way it does get progressively more intense, but stick to it. Even if you don't get certain parts or know what's going on, it could still be very well cleared up later on at some point. And at the end the main point or main conclusion will be made pretty clear, at least I think so. Now, the video will be covering a section from a book of a philosopher, a lecturer at Trinity College in Dublin, philosopher Paul O'Grady, because I think that his book has got a lot of great and interesting battles in it, and a lot for us to learn. But if you don't care about O'Grady or the larger discussion of relativism I'm having here, that's okay. You don't have to watch anything else other than this if you're just interested in logic, even if I'm suggesting it. Just take it more as a kind of signpost if you want more information, if I do suggest another video at various parts of this one. Trust me, even if you don't watch any other things, this will still be a great video introducing the ideas of logic and the possibility of alternatives in philosophy. Finally, I just want to thank my Patreon supporters. Slick Pockets. But now let's start the show and hear a short recap of how we got here first. Logic versus Relativism This video is part of a series covering a few books on relativism before we go back to the battlefield of the philosophy of science where we had encountered some extreme relativists. And trust me, it's going to be awesome when we do go back because of what we learn here in the battlefield of metaphysics. In particular, this video is covering a section in this green book simply called Relativism by Paul O'Grady. We previously already covered in a video his first chapter that explains the power of relativism that I visualize as this philosophic weapon. That video explains how this philosophic weapon came into being in modern philosophic warfare as empowered by five great philosophers and thus how it's possible that even a reasonable person may perhaps be led into believing that everything is relative. Not just what flowers look the best or what candy tastes the best, or who's the best philosophy YouTuber, it's me obviously, but that everything is relative. They feel truth, knowledge, scientific fact, logic, even reality is relative. Nothing is objective, nothing absolute. Now that's an extreme position, but the powers of this weapon is actually based in philosophic writing and the history of science. It's not just some made up contrived stuff here, so please go check out that video if you'd like to really understand why one can't just offhand dismiss a relativist. When you really see the reasoning, it can be clearly a difficult enemy to challenge. But also, this wickedly powerful weapon is an important one for philosophers to use ourselves in investigation to challenge to question claims of objectivity. It's just that, unlike these extreme relativists, we will gain the understanding to see that it does still in fact have limits. And Paul O'Grady in his book covers two places where he defends against the charges of relativism, where those limits of this weapon should be, on truth and rationality. So these are the two battles that I wanted to cover, one on truth and one on rationality. And actually we already covered that first battle defending truth and trust me it was so awesome. So if you're interested in just trying to figure out how to defeat this enemy in terms of defending a non-relative truth in particular, then you can check out this video. But to be honest, the way I presented it was that O'Grady does a kind of setup first where he actually uses a logical principle of non-contradiction to then go into battle on these two areas. So it's understandable that he actually has a section devoted to relativism about logic in particular right in that first chapter, where he's going to discuss whether or not, or to what extent, we can have alternative logics. Whether logic is relative. So that's what we're going to be covering right now, and I did promise I'm going to try and go a little faster in this normal one because it kind of was just an additional section to that first great battle. 
But I thought it might be also nice for me to show y'all what formal symbolic logic actually looks like if you're not familiar with it, it might be kind of cool to actually visually see. And it will also give you a kind of good mental understanding to sit in the background of what philosophers really mean when we're talking about logic, versus just some, you know, I don't know, it's like a political hack on the internet touting rhetoric about how logic is on their side. Uh, we mean something much more than that. So despite me trying to blast through some stuff, uh, since I am still covering what O'Grady says, as usual I will cite things down to the line, and when I'm not speaking for or giving my interpretation or presentation for our purposes of what O'Grady says in the text, then the citation in the corner of the screen will just disappear. That way you'll know it's coming from me, and what is coming from my interpretation of what he's saying. Cool? Get it? Okay, let's go. Logic is intimately tied into issues of truth because of the notions of coherence and contradiction. Not everyone feels that way though, some will say it's more noticeably about inferences than about truth, but I don't have time to deal with them here, and most do see logic as having something to do with truth, and I already mentioned a couple of logical laws in the previous battle against the alithic relativist, alithic being about truth and relativism as in being dependent on something else. And namely, I mentioned the laws of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle. And if you want to see that, uh, you know what to do. <laughs> anyway, the question is, even if yeah, so say the truth isn't relative, even if the truth is absolute, couldn't there still be legitimate alternative systems of logic? Or is there just one most basic, one correct one? O'Grady then tries to explain what logic even is, saying it's fundamental to human reasoning. It governs the process of inferring beliefs in a truth-preserving way, such that if one starts with true beliefs and then makes no mistakes in logic, one is guaranteed to have true beliefs as a conclusion. This is usually what we call validity, and it's the central notion in logic. A valid argument is one where if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. Now, thousands of years ago, Aristotle was the first to codify logical laws and principles, but they were around even before him. But this codification marks it as a formal discipline. So I'm going to try now and explain this as best as I can with some actual visual examples that might help us for the background for the rest of this video. Logic is a way of reasoning, and let's look at three examples of mine. If it's true that if it rains you should put on a coat, and then you find out it is raining, we can conclude you should put on a coat. We just kind of reason it out. Or for another example, if it's true that if it rains then the street would be wet, but then you find out the street isn't wet, then you can conclude that it didn't rain. This is us using logic to figure this out. Simple right? But let's do one more. Let's just for the sake of argument imagine that it's true that either it's raining or we're eating pizza. But we find out, hey, we're not eating pizza we can conclude, then it is raining. So logic is the ability for us to figure out a conclusion that kind of preserves the same amount of certainty as the stuff that led to the conclusion. So technically logic isn't about figuring out if those premises are true or not, but just that if they are, the conclusion must be true. So like in this example, logic won't be telling us if it's actually true that it's actually raining outside, for example. Unless, of course, you know, it's raining is derived from some other argument prior. In any case, logic is just what's helping us reason out this conclusion. And philosophers have codified that like math has been codified. And just to help us with a comparison to math, which actually is going to be a running theme later on, reasoning in math doesn't need to look like this. This is kind of a codification and symbolization of math. Technically, one doesn't even need to know any of what these things even mean to reason out mathematically. In fact, when we first teach this symbolic math to children, we actually teach them the reasoning in other ways first, without this symbolic language. For example, we might say, hey, look at all your fingers, put them up. You see, there is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 up. Now put two fingers down. Now see how many fingers you have left up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So there are 8 fingers up. Thus children may be able to figure out how many fingers are up without even being literate or even ever having to see these particular symbols ever. But math has been formalized and symbolized and has functions that we slowly begin to teach children moving away from saying something like, I give you 5 apples but you eat 2 apples, to just saying, 
you have five apples, but take away two apples. Then we just stop saying take away and start saying minus two instead. Also, we'll just stop saying the apples, so we end up saying just five minus two. Then again, perhaps we will teach them a more appropriate way of saying it as five subtract two while showing these symbols in particular. Then we fully begin to discuss our numerical or quantified reasoning through this mathematical symbolic language in ways that don't even have to connect to real world stuff. We don't have to be talking about apples and oranges or whatever else anymore to do math like this through symbols. So now a similar type of thing has happened and from here I'm just going to ask you to follow along as much as you possibly can. But if you get lost, don't worry, we're going to go back to O'Grady, uh, but I think this will be pretty fun. So similarly, philosophers have made it so that we can symbolize the process of this stuff. But by representing these propositions as letters we'll be using in our calculations and having certain symbols to represent those relations between propositions, kind of like these symbols in math, I guess you could say, such as the if then symbol, a conditional symbol. So if P, then Q or this symbol for negation. And while we have these symbols, we also have inference rules that allow us to use these symbols and figure things out using these symbols in different ways. For example, if P, then Q. Well, given P, therefore Q. <laughs> this is called modus ponens. It's super simple and it fits pretty well with our first example. But now let's look at that second example. If these propositions are represented by these letters, then we can show it as if P, then Q. And we find out that not Q. Thus, we can conclude not P. This is called modus tollens. Again, so like that first one was allowing us to show the truth of P that led us to the truth of Q, this one kind of allows us to use the negation to move backwards. The falsehood of Q, or rather not Q, allows us to figure out not P backwards. And now for our third example, if these are our definitions, we can present this with an OR symbol. And we can do something called disjunctive syllogism, where P or Q means either this or that, which means both can't be false. If one is false, the other has to be true. So if we have not Q, it means that we can conclude P. So that's what these would look like. But again, remember, logic isn't actually figuring out if not Q is really true for this argument. We have to find out other ways to actually verify not Q in this case. It's just that if it were not Q, then we can conclude P must be the case. And so this is a valid deduction. Deduction is either valid or not. If it is valid, it can be sound or not. And we know if it is sound by some other means, by figuring out if this particular argument still has all its premises are actually true. Now that might not seem like an important distinction, but actually it's very important for a philosopher. Because sometimes your enemy presents an argument and technically their logic is valid, as in these things really do lead to this conclusion logically. So the problem isn't that it isn't valid, just that perhaps you question one or more of the premises as being true. So you're not saying the argument isn't valid, but that it isn't sound. Because say this premise isn't true, for example. Now that may be not super important for what we're going to be talking about in this video, so don't worry about trying to remember all these things if you don't know about it. But it is super important for philosophers just to be accurate about what we're criticizing in another to ensure our attacks actually land. But getting back to the symbols now, Let's go and make a big old puzzle, but now kind of like not needing apples anymore, we're not even going to need these definitions, we're just going to show these letters. Because we don't even really care if it's sound, we're just going to be trying to figure out if it's a valid deduction. So let me just add a couple of other things so we can make a bigger one just as an example. First of all, DN or double negation. It's where there's two knots. Two knots cancel each other out, so not not P through double negation just makes P, and vice versa. That one's pretty easy. We kind of spoke about this previously in the previous video. But also there's another one where P and Q, written maybe with this symbol instead of ampersand, could be simplified through the process of simplification either as P or as Q. And the other process can happen too, where if you have P and Q in different places, you could actually just put them together through something called adjunction and have P and Q. Anyway, now let's look at this one for funsies. If Q then P, 
Q or R? If R, then not S. Given T and S, prove Q. It's like a puzzle, isn't it? Let's solve it now. So, we're given T and S. We can simplify that to just S. And with just S, we can make it not not S through double negation, right? Because it's the same thing. But with not not S and if R not S, we can do modus tollens and therefore get not R. Because remember, whoop. So that's not R. And with not R and Q or R, we can do disjunctive syllogism, therefore getting us Q. Because remember, if it's not R, then it has to be Q. And with Q and if Q then P, we do our basic modus tonins and therefore conclude P. <laughs> Boom. Done. That's the proof. We've proved P. If these are all true, then given this, one can prove logically this must be true. Fun, huh? Well, if you didn't think so, that's okay. It's like a puzzle, and if you learn all the rules intimately and do more puzzles, it can be super fun, just like doing math or stats puzzles or playing chess or doing Sudoku. I don't know, they can all be super fun if you play them. And it can really be cool and enjoyable to take the truth of this and run it through this big old process and get a result here considered a proof. This is really basic stuff though. And actually, there are far more advanced logics than this. But let me just stop there before I cut myself off too early. When it comes to logic being presented in this way, it's called formal logic. And it is a kind of symbolic logic. So personally, just to be clear, when I find some in the common regular non-mathematicians, non-philosophers, non-computer scientists saying logic, they kind of just generally mean some kind of reasoning. Something like, I believe what I believe based on this. This is what I think and I think this makes sense. That's my logic. Well, that seems really loose and open, and it seems to also sometimes mix or not even regard the difference between soundness and validity. But either way still, there's some understanding that logic has something to do with some kind of reasoning. But when philosophers say logic, it pays to mention if you mean formal logic like this. Like as in a system created for us to do reasoning in of a certain kind. Kind of like saying, I'm doing math to a mathematician, they will tend to now really think of math in this way in particular. This may just seem like an aside, but trust me, it will come into play later. Formal logic just systematizes and articulates the kind of inferences we make in our everyday reasoning processes to help us figure out valid reasoning versus fallacious reasoning. Fallacious is if a conclusion doesn't actually follow from the premises. Well, Aristotle's classic formal logic was so good that a couple of thousand years later, Immanuel Kant was like logic is a completed science, nothing to add. But then there was a renewed interest in logic in the 19th century because of big developments happening in math. And as we've been mentioning in like the last four videos I think, German mathematician and philosopher Gottlieb Frege made one of the most significant contributions with his, uh, Berg, Beg, Beger? Big riff sh ah, bigger shrift. Forgive me for not knowing how to say this properly. I've read it a thousand times. I just I just don't have friends to tell me how to say things. Anyway, bigger shrift actually kind of looks like this. But it was Frege's writings who actually brought forward a more modern symbolic logic. It was even more sophisticated than Aristotle's and could articulate relations and generalities in such a way that one could even show mathematical truths derived from logical truths. So like I was saying earlier, we can do a mental processing that we call reasoning which makes use of a kind of logic in terms of inferring beliefs from other beliefs. And formal logic systematizes and makes a symbolic language of us doing that kind of reasoning which actually helps us do that kind of thing. But maybe we could say there's another kind of mental processing, perhaps we'll call it calculating, which is the use of math. And this math stuff is also systematized and put into a symbolic kind of language which helps us do that. Well, Frege's articulation was actually so good, it made it possible to show that maybe even math actually is from logical reasoning, that it isn't a unique different kind of thought processing. This was called logicism, and Russell and Whitehead furthered that position in their famous Principia Mathematica, showing their logical systems and how they can derive mathematical truths from them. What? Logic was shown to be more fundamental to our mental processing than math? That actually math comes from it? Wow, so cool! <laughs> uh, 
At least I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, they only actually used five basic symbols in their logic. But later, Wittgenstein, you know, who came after, uh, it goes Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein. Anyway, Wittgenstein in the TLP, the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, which is his most famous writing from when he was younger, actually suggested breaking down all of logic to just one symbol. Actually, I think Wittgenstein used the Schaeffer stroke to show this, and really Schaeffer was the first to show this, I think, uh, to show that we can do all of propositional logic with just one symbol. But I'm not sure if he was the first to actually show it. So if you're a logician and you know who was actually the first to show this, uh, let me know in the comments below. But also, if I remember correctly, I think Wittgenstein was trying to show that even predicate logic can be expressed with it too. But anyway, if that sounds like nonsense, don't worry about it. Basically, we have these five symbols, right? the if then conditional, the if and only if by conditional, this symbol which is basically and, uh, the or symbol which means that one of the two must be true, both can't be false, and the negation symbol. So there's five symbols, right? But actually, I can be fine doing it all with just one symbol. What? Really? Just one symbol? How are you gonna do that? Well, let me show you. Firstly, this by conditional is pretty easy. P if and only Q. All it means that both if P then Q and also if Q then P. It was just a combination of both anyway to show that if you have one you can get the other and it goes both ways. So scratch that one since we can actually express it simply by using both of these in separate ways. But now what about this one, the conditional if P then Q. How can I replace that? Well actually I can replace it with the OR symbol by saying not P or Q. Wait, what? Why? Well, if you remember, at least one must be true. So if one is false, we know the other is true. And so if Q is false or not Q, then we can conclude not P must be true. And that's also basically modus tollens here. If P then Q, but we have not Q, then you know we would have not P. So it works in both senses. But now also, if it's not not P, then it has to be Q. Not not P is the same as P, remember, with double negation? So that's the same thing as saying if P, then Q. So actually these are logically equivalent. So I can express an if then just using or. So scratch that one too. Now what about these last three? Well check it out. You can take the Schaeffer stroke to mean, well it can either mean nand, which is to say not and, or nor, which is to say not or. As far as I can tell, I think you just gotta be clear on which one you mean when you're using it. And for some reason it seems that people use the arrow down to be nor and is also associated with pierce and this arrow, the arrow up, is more associated with nand. And I don't really know why. I'm not really a logician or anything, I'm just trying to be as honest and truthful as possible here. Remember, we're actually trying to talk about relativism. But anyway, I, I can't tell technically why it is that way. But as far as I can tell, I think it just matters what you're actually clear on when you actually do use it. So if this slash means nor, this Schaeffer stroke, then it means that both must be false. That neither this, nor this. So to show not P, you would show neither P nor P. The only options for P here show that they are false. So with this Schaeffer stroke, I don't technically need this not symbol. To show and, P and Q, I can show it by saying neither neither P nor P nor neither Q nor Q. Remember this is negating both sides, saying both sides must be false. So to say not P is to say this. And if both of these are therefore not this and not this, and both of those are shown as being negative because they're shown with this, and that flips them back to being both true, and thus you are saying P and Q. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, so that means I don't actually need that symbol either. I can show it all with just this stroke. And also, I can even show P or Q by showing neither neither P nor Q nor neither P nor Q. And you can look at that and figure out how that one makes sense yourself if you'd like. But either way, the point is I don't even need this. And so I can show all of these just by using one symbol, this Schaeffer stroke. Just this line. And you know what? Technically, it doesn't even have to be this one symbol. In fact, I can make it all another symbol, or rather I can just take this line to mean something else, the NAND, the arrow up instead, and they would look like this. 
Anyway, this is not at all important to remember for us and our sake, so let's just take a deep breath and clear our mind a bit and not feel too bogged down if you didn't get what I was saying. Let's just get back to O'Grady. The point is that we can break it all down to just one symbol if we wanted, or more if we wanted more, depending on what suits us best. Each would be its own system, so we could make a new system with four, or one with six. But hey, the real question comes if maybe we can make an altogether new system we set up with new symbols that tell us to do completely different things. Hmm. Anyway, there's really no limit to how many systems you could have. One just set up a new set of symbols and a new system of rules of inference and a new system appeared. But these would be syntactic systems pure theoretical or formal, like not connected to anything outside of it. When it comes to having to connect to things outside of it, like those letters representing real world stuff or true or false representing ones and zeros on a computer, then yeah, then it seems like there's limits on what those systems could be. And how are they, these new systems, even related back to how we normally commonly just do reasoning logically, you know, without these formal systems before us? There were so many systems that could be very different, not just different from the Principia Mathematica, but from the way we normally do daily common logical reasoning. Now there were two fundamental laws in the Principia Mathematica that actually go way back, all the way as presented to Aristotle in ancient times. Those were the law of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle. The law of non-contradiction holds that a proposition and its negation cannot be both true together. The law of the excluded middle holds that all propositions are either true or false. There is no third value. Both of these came up before when we battled against relativizing truth, arguing to keep both of these. And yo, you really gotta watch that previous video of truth versus relativism because Paulo Grady does some awesome stuff and some important lessons there that could last forever in philosophy, so please do check it out. Well, even those laws, logicians have experimented with getting rid of them in these new various systems that they can make. But is it possible that even they can kind of represent how we in common day do reasoning? Well, whoa, before we do that, let's just be clear about the difference between a classic logic with just a small change or a small difference and a full-blown alternative logic. So philosopher Susan Hack actually has a very useful way of distinguishing between systems that are actually rivals versus those that are just slightly added to. So a basic logical system is symbols that have rules on how to set up those symbols and what some of those symbols mean as in what it says about their relation. Those are the inference rules or transformation rules, like modus ponens or modus tonens like I showed you earlier. These things are also called well-formed formulas by hack, but whatever. Anyway, now this is just a syntactic characterization of how thus a structure is set up. A semantic characterization is the idea that truth of the premises that we put into the system is preserved in the conclusion we get out. Now, if we have two systems that are set up the same with the same transformation rules but just looking different with different symbols but they mean the same thing, then that's not really a rival system. The real differences start when you get two systems, let's call them A and B, that share the same basic symbols but B has more symbols, and thus more theorems and greater expression. We'll call this extended logic. It doesn't actually clash with the earlier classic system, just adds to it. O'Grady gives the example of modal logic with the distinctions of necessity and possibility, which is a kind of logic that I didn't really do, but I can imagine it. One that I have done that I think would count here is called quantified predicate logic. It's the one where you have the universal and existential symbols. Uh, logicians, forgive me, it's been a long time. But anyway, another difference here is if the symbols actually mean something different, if there's actually different rules of inference. In that case, A would be a classic logic and B would be a deviant logic. I assume because of how much it deviates, not because of how naughty it is in the bedroom to do. Or is it? Hey girl, you down to do some deviant logic with me back in my place? <laughs> okay, sorry, back to uh, philosophy. So an example of a deviant logic would be a three-valued logic, which we discussed three-valued logic in the previous video. Again, please, please do go check that one out. 
It's a system where something doesn't have to be either just true or false, it can be even some other thing. Anyway, another example would also be a quantum logic, where certain rules can be dropped in favor of different ones. Now, some of these deviant systems are actually proposed as a full-on replacement for classical logic. Like saying this three-valued system is actually superior and should replace the two-valued one in all cases. To be clear, for our question of relativism, advocating that one is just right, the right one in all cases that we should always use it, even if it is a deviant one, therefore isn't relativism. It's still saying that just one is correct, so it's not really relativism about logic, even if that one is a deviant one. But how can we determine which is the true system of logic? Relativism emerges if you say two or more systems are legitimate candidates and we can just choose between them and even move back and forth even. Why would we want to be able to move to another system? Well, Hack has four different sorts of reasons why one would want to do that that O'Grady outlines, and I'm gonna blast through these because I don't want this video to be too long like I said, I don't like how O'Grady phrased some stuff in here, and really it's not all that important for us to know the details of these, only important that there are legitimate reasons to want to use a deviant logic. So this just goes to show that the issue goes well beyond just, oh, we can create them. Firstly, there's a general metaphysical reason. An example of this is from Dutch mathematician Bauer, who thought, unlike Russell, that math actually can't be derived from logic. And while it can exist as calculating in the mind in a way without an explicit symbolic language, it is its own fundamental way of thinking. He felt the nature of math is that it is constructed by the intellect, so there couldn't be mathematical truths that are unknowable to the mind. But this logical principle of the excluded middle would mean that there are some math truths, even things we don't know, that are still nevertheless true or false, just we don't know them. Bauer denied this for mathematical truths, so he wanted to drop the law of the excluded middle. So I guess like for Bauer that means math truths can't be unknown? I'm not really sure here. Look, this is a section where I don't think O'Grady says things right because clearly there's a difference between unknowable or unjudgeable by the human mind versus just unknown or unjudged. But anyway, I guess if we really wanted to see what's going on here or with any of these things, I can just go and check out Susan Hack's fuzzy book. Or maybe for this one in particular, perhaps it came from Bauer's two-part paper. I, I don't really know if that's where it came from. I'm not sure because I didn't read Susan Hack's book. But if you want, here's the journey for you. You can read this and this and let us know. Anyway, maybe one day I can do Hack's book in a series on logic like I'm doing these three books on relativism right now. But anyway, the second reason Hack presents is a desire to avoid philosophical problems. Some philosophical commitments may be considered troublesome. An example of that is that someone wants to avoid fatalism, the doctrine that events are predetermined and unamenable to free will. And one version of that comes just from accepting the law of the excluded middle. It is either true or false that I will be knocked down by a car tomorrow. Even though I have no way of knowing which, it is the case that one of these options is a determinate fact. Remember with the excluded middle something is either true or false. Not both, not some new thing. So facts about the future must already be set in that way. And for those of us who want to believe free will, that my choice which hasn't been made yet should impact what is true or false, this could be seen as a problem. Now there are different ways to deal with this, one can just say that facts about the future can't be true or false, but doing that has a price. You wouldn't even be able to say the sun will rise tomorrow is true then. So instead of doing that, just denying the excluded middle could be one way of diffusing the fatalist issue while at the same time allowing some future statements to be true. In any case, the third source of reasons that motivates adopting another logic is a desire to avoid scientific problems. Whereas the previous ones dealt more with dropping the excluded middle, this one's more closer to dropping the law of non-contradiction. The reason being how these deviant logics work with well-confirmed stuff happening in science, namely quantum physics. Now I had questioned this, but whatever. The idea is quantum particles behave in ways not describable in the standard laws of logic, like quantum superpositioning. Now O'Grady uses David Z. Albert's quote about the path of quantum particles, but ultimately says of this quantum logic that it drops what are called the classical distribution laws. 
but the distribution laws isn't the law of non-contradiction. I just want to be clear on that. But anyway, for the next one, the fourth reason is a desire for logical innovation. Systems can actually be made to drop the law of non-contradiction. Why do that? Is it just useless? Well, you know, it's pretty much just making them for the sake of expanding our minds sort of thing. And maybe it can also help us to understand paradoxes and stuff too. So those are the four reasons O'Grady outlines that Hack has for why someone would even move to an alternative logic. It's not just a trivial or for the fun of it type of thing that different systems can be made. But now let's see some objections against alternative logics. Ah, the husband-wife duo. Influential historians of logic W. Neal and M. Neal hold that even from a purely formal point of view, the ordinary two-valued system has a unique status among deductive systems, which can possibly be called logic, since it contains all others as fragments of itself. In short, they are not alternatives to classical logic. But this can be challenged. Truths from multi-valued logics actually may not appear, in fact cannot appear in classic two-valued systems. I think that one's kind of obvious. I don't know why they even said that. Ben O'Grady says the distinctive position here seems just historical, a long-standing tradition, but tradition can hardly stop philosophers. And I agree with O'Grady on that heavily, but I would like to note that from that quote though, there's actually nothing in it to suggest that the Neils were making their claim on the basis of long-standing tradition, but it reads like O'Grady is saying that's what it seems like their position also is, but didn't cite that part or put a quote for it. Uh, not saying O'Grady is wrong about them, uh, he certainly knows the Neils ever more than I ever will, but just pointing it out that that quote actually had nothing to do with long-standing tradition of a two-valued system. Anyway, O'Grady then devotes a few pages particularly to an argument by the champion philosopher Quine, who uses the translation argument against deviant logics. He gives us the details of the background and all that and I don't really think that's fully necessary for our purposes, especially to show what O'Grady's position ultimately is, but I'll blast through it super fast just so that I'm not depriving y'all of at least mentioning it given how much time O'Grady devotes to talking about it. And I think you'll see why he's doing that though. So like I said, not to confuse anyone, but I'm gonna go kinda fast and be a little bit lax on this. See, first there was these folks, right, and we'll call them rational intuitionists, who thought that logical truths can actually be known in a special way prior to having any experience of anything. So like, you don't have to make any observations in the world, you can just kinda think about it and realize it's true. And so that's you using your kind of rational intuition to grasp it's true. And while there are a lot of logical truths that we know because we infer them from other ones, some of them can actually be known just straight up immediately with rational intuition, no other premises required. And even some of those things that the rational intuition can figure out for us can even reveal the nature of reality, like some fundamental truths about how the world works. Anyway, Russell, who co-authored the Principia Mathematica, that book that shows logic more fundamental than math, you know, logicism and whatnot, well he felt this way too, that logical truths are known through our rational intuition, not through any experience like other empirically dependent beliefs. While at first that kind of makes sense for us, actually that would seem super spooky and mystical for the positivists, so they were all like, yo, F that, but then to explain or make sense of how we grasp logical truths then, they claim that we know logical truths because they are dependent on the linguistic framework we make or are using. And if you think of it, that also kind of makes sense based on what we're saying. Remember, we can make different syntactic structures if we want to. So positivists advanced a linguistic theory of logical truths, holding that logic derives from linguistic rules. And there's different and many complex versions of this, but Carnap was one of them. Remember, he was a positivist philosopher who thought that we could make different linguistic frameworks or as we might want to start calling it different logics for scientists to use. So for those with the linguistic theory of logic, all logic really is is just following the rules within a linguistic practice, which if you think of it kind of implies there wasn't particularly anything special or deep about logic beyond merely which linguistic framework we are using. And I guess that's where we kind of are now, and now we're going to see Quine respond to this because Quine ain't down with us, you see, because Quine likes logic. So Quine agreed with the criticism against the intuitionists because he too wants to be empirical in certain ways, and we'll get to that in another chapter, but he thought there was actually no need to bother trying to explain logic with something else as if there's something more fundamental to it. Quine be like logic is so fundamental to thought you can't explain or argue for it with something else. 
O'Grady says of Quine, logic is so basic to our thinking that nothing more fundamental could explain it. So Quine be like, nah, you don't need something to explain it, cause if you understand the language, you will just give assent to logic anyway, it's obvious. And anyone who correctly understands the language in question will just give assent to a logical truth as an obvious truth. Yeah, you could have trivially different logical systems in textbooks and whatnot, but when it comes to actual deviant logics, well, if someone comes up to you and is like, hey yo, P and not P, you will be like, no, this, this isn't a sincere deviant logical person. It's better to just assume that they probably don't understand what and means or what not means, or they actually mean something completely different when they say it. Because the assumption is if they did know what those things mean in the way that we do, they simply would not be saying it. It's just always better to believe there's actually a mistranslation going on, even if we don't know exactly what it is, than to believe someone is actually using a deviant logic. He compares it to Master David Hume's move of saying, if you come across some claims to miracles, it's better to believe, nah, there must be some explanation to this than there actually being a miracle, and that it's always better to believe there is some actual explanation for some event, even if we don't know what that explanation is yet, than to believe there's a miracle. And Quine's boy Davidson, well, boy, no, uh, sorry for my colloquialism. Anyway, that is, Quine's former student, Davidson, took this argument to a whole next level, not just for logic, but even against different conceptual schemes. Now, part of the reason of this book isn't just to survey all the places where relativists can attack and where O'Grady can defend, but also, actually, he wants to battle Davidson to the death. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. There's no actual violence here and even what O'Grady wants to do isn't actually all that confrontational with Davidson, I find. He just wants to present a softer argument rather than a hard argument Davidson does in his chapter on rationality. So maybe that explains why he went to some depth of the background of this argument from Quine 2, talking about it here, even mentioning the positivists and stuff like that which I didn't bother getting into. O'Grady says he will talk about both of these philosophers anyway in different places though when he gets to them. But for right now, he's gonna suggest that Quine's argument ain't that perfect in part because it's coming from him, nothing personal. Just pointing out that this argument seems to anticipate or set up a just offhand rejection of deviant logics a priori. But Quine's whole epistemological thing is that there are no a priori, nothing we know before experiencing it. Everything can be changed with experience. No beliefs have any kind of special, unchangeable place. But at the same time, it seems he's making logic special here. And remember, the translation argument is an argument that a priori rejects deviant logics. So what's going on here, Quine? You all over the place. <laughs> well, O'Grady admits, the precise interpretation of Quine's position is a delicate and disputed issue. So it seems O'Grady is open to a Quinean philosopher defending Quine and clarifying the different positions Quine has taken and evolved over time in which particular ways. Also, my presentation of Quine would probably make a Quinean even more frustrated. And heck, this ain't even my own detailed covering of O'Grady talking about Quine. It's just my blast through. But to be fair, again, O'Grady does say he will look into Quine himself in more detail and clarify his position better than he has done here, at least in this chapter. At least he will do better when he gets to his chapter in ontology. Anyway, there's other problems for Quine's argument too. Like, it just assumes a classic two-valued logic is what's obviously deep in the mind, fundamental and all, so everything outside of it we kind of just translate to it. But there's no argument here in particular for why this obviously correct thing in the mind can't be for someone else, say an intuitionist logician, having a 3 plus valued logic, or something else. The argument just states that there is a base logic, but there is no argument here for what that logic has to be, that it has to be a classic 2 valued system and not a deviant one. Also, it seems Quine is using considerations about translation because of his own commitment to empiricism and behaviorism, but one could argue that empirical evidence isn't appropriate to determine the nature of logic. I mean, maybe there's some metaphysical underpinning that can explain why logic is special. In any case, O'Grady seems to hold that there are indeed arguments against deviant logics, but they aren't all that perfect. There's flaws in him. O'Grady then goes on to describe his own position that looks like this. He says, and we're going to quote this line by line while I give my own visualization of it. 
even if one accepts a deviant system and believes there are good philosophical grounds for defending it, there seems to be general regulative principles governing the choice of a logical system. These include consistency, coherence, simplicity, efficacy, and so on. Our choice of a logical system is itself governed by a more general conception of rationality. He says there are notions of logic that operate up here, and those are what he argues for in his chapter on rationality, the law of non-contradiction, and he says he won't argue for it, but it's possible that for the reasons of simplicity, we would also have up here a two-valued system, the law of the excluded middle, simply because then you don't have to mess around with truth. Where does that leave the legitimacy of deviant logic? Well, it's pretty clear that multi-valued systems are possible and there's no compelling formal argument against having them. But also up here, the meta level that governs the adoption of such systems is committed to at least the law of non-contradiction and probably for reasons of simplicity to the law of the excluded middle lower level contacts requiring suspension of this. To require the existence of such a meta level is to argue for the core conception of rationality, which will be argued for in chapter 5. This is an absolute non-relative conception, governing degrees of diversity beneath it. So the upshot of this discussion is that there are legitimate alternative logical calculi useful for various purposes, but ultimately governed by a system adhering to the traditional laws of logic. And with that, the chapter ends. So we see O'Grady does allow relativism on logic in terms of the lower level, but argues that there are some principles of logic on the meta level or above which he defends, and he will be calling the core conception of rationality, once again leading us to that second great battle where he defends against relativism on his chapter on rationality. So we gotta go and check that out. This means though for some folks that come up and be like, hey, this isn't relative, it's logical. You could say there are actually different logics back to that, but ultimately they may be just saying something about how basic rationality that governs fundamental way we think is nevertheless beholden to logical laws. If that's what they are saying, you could say, so you mean rationality isn't relative? Which is kind of different. But maybe that's just not much criticism behind what they meant to say. Only that it's probable that they don't really understand logic in the way philosophers or logicians or mathematicians do. Certainly many people don't know there are different kinds of maths as well. Different interpretations of what counts as the correct mathematical procedure that perhaps mathematicians and philosophers are familiar with but the common person isn't. So it's much easier for the common person to say math and mean something about the fundamental ways we think about things. In any case, is logic relative? It seems like yeah, it is, but logical principles kind of are necessary to the way we think. Certainly there are actual alternatives and you can actually pick different logics depending on what you need. But can we use a different logic, at least in terms of the principle of non-contradiction in the way we actually think, in the way our rationality is? Well, O'Grady will argue, nope, we cannot. So let's go see that awesome battle now against a relativist that would argue even rationality is relative. Oh, and before you go, I just want to say very quickly, uh, unscripted, uh, if you like my visualization or my videos here, please go check out some of the other ones and please actually do subscribe to my channel. If you can, please support me on Patreon or send me a direct donation to PayPal. It's really difficult and it takes hundreds of hours to make these videos and I don't get much support even socially. As you can see, my subscriber count isn't even that high, so it's not like even YouTube pays me for this. So if you can do that, that would be great. That could really be nice, you know? Other than that, I just want to say, let's get to the next battle of rationality versus relativism. And remember, philosophers keep battling.